Hey everybody, I'm Bob Smith, and welcome back to Latin 2. In this video, I'll be covering Chapter 12 from Wheelock's Latin Grammar. Uh, Wheelock's is one of the best deals going in textbooks. It's around $20. Now, there's even, even a Kindle edition that's about $12. Uh, most textbooks are, are outrageously priced, usually in the hundreds of dollars, so it's good to see that HarperCollins is keeping this thing affordable. So if you haven't picked up a copy, make sure you get one. In Chapter 12, we're going to be introduced to the perfect active system. So let's go ahead and start taking a look at this. In chapter 12, we finally get to find out why we had to memorize all those principal parts for verbs. So like I told you all throughout Latin 1, when you memorize the verbs, make sure you memorize all four principal parts. Even though we only used two of them, that way you don't have to go back and, and relearn uh, all the principal parts that we didn't learn from Latin 1. So hopefully you committed all those to memory. So the perfect active system, we're finally going to get to use that third principal part of a verb. And the good news is all conjugations work the same. So we won't have to differentiate between first, second, third, third, io, and fourth. Uh, you know, the good news is we take that perfect stem, that third principal part, and stick new endings on it. So let's take a look at this model verb that we have. Uh, we'll pick the first conjugation because it's one of the easier ones to recognize. Laudo, laudare, laudawi, laudatum. So we're going to use that laudawi part this time. So this is what we're looking at here, this laudawi. Previously, we learned the present system, which you remember was the present, future, and imperfect tenses. And those were based on the present stem, that second principal part. So this one right here. So last semester we really concentrated on this thing. The perfect system, these three new tenses, the perfect, future perfect, and pluperfect, use that third principal part. And we're going to get the perfect stem out of that. All conjugations form the perfect system the same way. So like I said, good news there. It's just the perfect active stem plus some new endings we're going to have to memorize. The good news is some of them look really familiar. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these just to kind of get an idea of what we're going to look at. Uh, again, well, before we do that, let's go look at these four principal parts and if we had to translate them, how we would translate them. So here we have laudao, laudare, laudawi, laudatum. Remember, laudo is always first person singular, present active indicative. I praise. Laudare is the present infinitive to praise. Laudawi, that's first person singular, perfect active indicative. I praised, I have praised. And we'll talk about that translation here in a little bit. And then laudatum, technically that's called a perfect passive participle. Uh, we'll use it when we get to the perfect passive system, but if we were just going to translate it as the participle, we could say praised or having been praised. So again, don't worry too much about translating uh, these individual parts right now. Just be aware that they do represent real forms. The principal parts of the other verbs that have appeared in the paradigms are as follows. This is out of your book. Moneo, modere, monui, monitum, uh, ago, agare, egi, octum, Copio, copere, kepi, coptum. So you'll notice there's a lot of variation in uh, that third principal part. Audio, audire, audiwi, auditum, sum esse fui. So kind of a strange one there. Futurum, that's our verb to be. And then you'll notice some of them only have three of the four principal parts. Posum, pose, potui. So it lacks that perfect passive participle. But that's okay. There's no regular pattern for the third and fourth principal parts. So, unlike all these memorizations we had to do with the previous for first, second, third, and all that mess, <clears throat> the main thing we're just going to have to do is just memorize the verb form. If you have been committing those to memory, this is going to be much, much easier. Forming the perfect stem is going to be dead simple. Drop the I from the third principal part, and that's going to be your perfect active stem. Then we're going to put some new endings onto it. So again, more memorization. But since you've been in Latin for a while, you're hopefully pretty used to that. 
So here are some of these new endings that we're going to memorize. So here's what we have. We have this uh, perfect active stem. So we took the third principal part, dropped the I, and here are the endings we're going to add to it. So first person singular, we'll just have to put that I back on. Uh, but let's kind of go through these endings. E, isti, it. So there are the singular forms. And then the plural, emus, istis, erunt. So those are the forms we're going to stick on this perfect stem to form the perfect active indicative. And if we look at this next model verb that we have uh, from ago agere, egi actum, we would have egi, egisti, egit, egimus, egistis, egerunt. So again, the good news is absolutely regular. Even for irregular verbs like to be, sum esse fui futura. We have fui, fuisti, fuit, fuimus, fuistis, fuirunt. So again, it's just taking these endings and sticking it on the perfect stem, the perfect active stem. So very, very simple. The next tense that we're going to look at here in this perfect active system is called pluperfect, and here in a minute we'll talk about how you would translate these things. Uh, hopefully you've memorized the verb to be in the present. Uh, if you have, all we have to do is take those different verb forms and stick them straight onto this stem. So let's look down here. So we have our model verb, uh, laudo laudare. So we get that perfect stem, laudal, and we're going to add... For the pluperfect, we're going to add the imperfect of the verb to be. So we're going to add iram, iras, irat, iramus, iratus, irant. So we end up with kind of a big mouthful here, but uh, ladawe ram, ladawe ras, ladawe rat, ladawe ramus, ladawe ratus, and ladawe rat. So again, this part's actually fairly easy. Hopefully these forms are something you've already committed to memory. Even on the imperfect verbs. So the verb to be when we do the pluperfect. We take the imperfect forms, stick them onto the perfect stem. Fu eram, fu eras, fu erat, fu eramus, fu eratus, and fu erat. So actually fairly simple. So perfect, some new endings. Pluperfect, we use the imperfect of the verb to be. Then when we do this third tense in the perfect system, future perfect, we take the endings, or we take the verb forms for the verb to be in the future, and with one exception, we just stick those straight onto the stem. So the endings would be for the future perfect active indicative, ero, iris, irit, irimus, iritus, and instead of irunt, we would have irint. So one of those things you have to keep in mind. A little bit different, but fairly regular, fairly easy to memorize. <coughs> Excuse me. So future active, future perfect active indicative, we would say for lado ladari would be ladawe ro, ladawe ris, ladawe rit, ladawe rimus, ladawe ritus, ladawe rent. Again, should be fairly easy. So we got these three new tenses, perfect, future perfect, pluperfect. In English, we really just have three main tenses. We have the, you know, things either happen in the past, the present, or the future. Uh, the Romans were very much interested in the past and being able to describe things very accurately in the past. So the perfect system allows for descriptions of things that have been, you know, completed in the past or will definitely have been completed. So remember, we're not talk talking about hypotheticals at this point. These are definitely things uh, that have either happened or, in the case of Future Perfect, haven't happened yet, but definitely will. So they expand on what we would have here in English. Remember from the present system, we already have a, a past tense with the imperfect, uh, which we very commonly translate just as a simple past tense with just words like was and things like that. Uh, the imperfect technically uh, indicates an action in the past that was continuous. So it started at some point in the past. So this is the imperfect tense that we learned before. Started at some point in the past and continued potentially all the way up until the present. So it's continuous past action. Uh, so instead of just translating it was, we probably would be better served to say, you know, I used to do this. I kept on. I was in the habit of doing this. 
Now, the perfect tense, in comparison, indicates an action that's definitely completed. So this action is definitely over. It's not tied to the past, uh, and it's fully completed at this point. We usually translate it with have as a helping verb. I have read the chapter. So perfect tense. Really doesn't have a whole lot of connections to the present. Um, has implications on the present, but it's something that's definitely in the past. The pluperfect indicates an action that is in the more distant past. Like I said, the Romans love to be able to describe when things happen. So the pluperfect can throw things even further back in the past. Again, something that's completely finished, has no ties to the present. And we usually translate with the English helping verb, had. So we have have, have with the perfect, had with the pluperfect. So in English, it may not make a whole lot of difference, uh, but to the Romans it sure did. Future perfect. So one more tense to look at here. <clears throat> this is an action that will have been completed by a future date. So it's still a future tense, but it indicates that we're kind of looking at it from a past perspective. So we might say something like this in English. You know, by the end of the semester, I will have memorized all the forms of the perfect system, meaning I haven't done it yet, but I definitely will. Not that I might, given the circumstances, but that it's definitely going to happen. With the perfect active system, uh, think of it as we take the present system and kind of shift it back into the past a little bit. So we have those three tenses that pretty much parallel the present system. They just are kind of shifted a little bit back into the past. So I'll show you a timeline here in a little bit. Oh, here it is right here. So here we have the tenses we learned in Latin 1. We have the present, things that are happening right now. Uh, imperfect, things in the past. In future, things that have not happened yet but will. So notice the imperfect. It, it could start anywhere back in the past and continue all the way up to the present. So continuous past action. This perfect system that we have really just takes the present system and shifts it a little bit to the past. Here's the perfect, something that's not tied in any, in any way to the present. It's definitely over. So there's the perfect. There's the pluperfect, even further back in the past. And then the future perfect. It's in the future. It hasn't happened yet, but it definitely will. So it looks, it looks at everything from a, uh, from a different perspective a perspective from the past itself. So again, the Romans are very picky about being able to describe things like this. So how can we translate these things? Since in English we don't really have uh, the precision that the Romans did, we'll have to, we can play with it a little bit. Uh, but we'll look at some good ways to make sure that this is clear, uh, especially to English speakers, what we're talking about. You know, we may say something like, uh, pluperfect, we could translate as, I had studied this previously, uh, and I understood it. So it had implications for the past, the pluperfect, the one that's the distant past. The perfect, the completed action definitely that's already completed. I have studied this, so I've already studied this, and so I understand it now. So it has implications on things going on right now. And then the future perfect. I will have studied by some point, by tomorrow, by the end of the semester. And so I will understand it with implications uh, into the future. I haven't done it yet, but I definitely will at some point. This chapter also mentions this thing called a synopsis. Uh, I won't stress this too much in the online class because it's, it's kind of difficult to do if you're having to type everything in. Uh, but they're actually very useful, and I'd encourage you to explore synopses. Uh, what a synopsis is, is now that we have all these forms memorized, it's getting to the point where it would be very difficult to conjugate a verb in all of its potential forms. You know, you'd, you'd spend you know half the day trying to conjugate all this mess. A synopsis picks a certain person and number, and then forms all the the, the the different conjugations based on that. So we might say, for example, this is a synopsis for the verb 
uh, ago agere. In the indicative mood, active voice, third person singular. So we say this is a synopsis of ago agere, third person singular, uh, indicative mood, active voice. So we just get only those individual forms. So we would have agit, present, aget, future, agebat, imperfect, egit would be the perfect form, egerit, future perfect, egerat, pluperfect. And again, with the translations, or he drives, he will drive, he was driving, he has driven, he will have driven, he had driven. So these are actually kind of fun when you get the hang of them. Uh, really kind of test your, your your memory on conjugating verbs. But again, in an online setting, it's actually fairly difficult to do. So we'll see what we can do with these. Uh, but that's what we're talking about when we see these things mentioned in the book. Let's take a look at the vocabulary. Again, we're going to get some new things to kind of expand on our, our Latin knowledge here, so probably some new verbs here at the end. Uh, and some of these, luckily, English cognates make these things actually fairly easy to remember. Uh, like this first one, adolescens, adolescentis, uh, can mean a young man. It can also mean a young woman, so it can either be masculine or feminine, depending on the connotation. Uh, so, of course, we get adolescent from that. Anus, ani. So hopefully everybody should be able to figure out that means year. So we get annual, uh, annuity, all those things that have a connotation with things that happen you know, in a yearly fashion. Asia, Asiae, Asia. When the Romans talk about Asia, they don't necessarily mean China. They mean more Asia Minor, Asia Minor, uh, more like Turkey the Middle East, that's the area that they're considering Asia. This next one should be extremely easy. Kaiser, Kaisaris. So this is reserve, This is referring to Caesar. Remember this starts out as a family name uh, and then thanks to Julius Caesar, his dictatorship, uh, it turns into an imperial title. Uh, it eventually morphs into these forms we see in Europe. Um, German kings are called Kaisers. Uh, the Russian czars are called czars, and these are just uh, corrupted forms of Caesar's name. Then we have mater, matris, mother. Again, should be fairly easy to remember that one. Uh, medicus, medici. Or sometimes you'll see it, medica, medici. So this is a doctor or a physician. So if it's a male physician, which most commonly that's what we would see, we'd have medicus. This female, we would have medica. Pater, patrice. So it's just a, a noun that means father. So we get paternal, paternity, all those things that deal with uh, with fathers and, and you know, that type of parentage. Here's a mouthful. Patientia, patientiae. Suffering, patience, endurance. So depending on the circumstance, you could translate it several different ways. So again, it looks like patience, but remember in Latin we have to really stress everything. Patientia, patientia. Then that next one, very similar. Principium, principii. Beginning. So we get principle and things like that from this uh, uh, noun. Principium, principii. Here we get an adjective. Acerbus, acerba, acerbum. Uh, meaning harsh or bitter. Uh, it can also mean grievous. So it can be a harsher, bitter taste or maybe a harsher, bitter feeling. Then we have a preposition that we use with an ablative, pro. Pro means in front of, before, uh, or sometimes you'll see it used as uh, on behalf of. Uh, when Cicero would write uh, legal arguments uh, on behalf of his clients, they would say usually pro plus the name of the client. Uh, pro Milone is in defense of Milo, you know, on the sake of Milo. It can also mean things like for, instead of, you know. So it can be translated several different ways depending on context. So pro plus ablative, in front of, or on behalf of, or for the sake of, or the defense of, depending on the circumstance. A little short adjective. Uh, it's one of my favorite adjectives in Latin. It's a little short word. Uh, that means for a long time. So du, little short word, but it means for a long time. Something's happened for a long time. 
Nuper, another adverb that means recently. And then here we go, we get some verbs from this chapter. Um, amito, amitere, amisi, amisum. So a verb we've seen before with a little prefix stuck on it. So amito, amitere, amisi, amisum. To send away, to lose, to let go. Cado, cadere, kikiri, kasurum. Uh, meaning to fall. So, you know, we get these words like decadence, decay, uh, accident comes from this. So, meaning to fall. So, if something physically uh, falls or crumbles away. Creo, creare, creawi, creatum. To create. So, again, we get all those creation words in English from it. Creo, creare, creawi, creatum. So let's, whoops, kind of went crazy there for a second. Let's go through these sentences, sententiae antiquae from the chapter. And again, the latest version doesn't have them numbered, so you're really going to have to pay attention uh, to where you're at. Hopefully in the next edition they'll put those numbers back in. So here's our first sentence. In principio, Deus creavit caelum et terum, et Deus creavit hominem. So this is a quote from the Latin translation of the Bible. Here's one you probably heard a little bit of this before. In triumpho, Kaiser praetulit hunc titulum veni vidi wiki. So Julius Caesar doing his triumph through the forum. He carries a little titulum, a little placard, and it says veni vidi wiki. So think about that and translate it out. Kind of an interesting one. The next one, wixit dum wixit bene. So by the poet Terence. So you'll have to think about this and how you can, you know, turn this idiom into something that makes sense in English. Here's a Cicero quote: "Adulescens volt dio vivere, senex dio wixit." So it's actually kind of a nice one there. The next one, "Non ille dio wixit, said dio fuit." Now, a quote from Seneca himself. Then the next one, another Terence quote. Hui, dixisti pulcre. So I love those you know, onomatopoeia type words like hui, which just means we. Uh, dixisti pulcre. Next one, we'll quote from Cicero again. Sophocles, ad sumum senectutem tragoideus fecit. So he's talking about the playwright Sophocles, the Greek writer. And you might notice, you know, this word here looks kind of strange. It's a it's a Greek word that's been taken into Latin, so it still kind of has a little bit of that uh, Greek characteristic. Sophocles ad sumum senectutem tragoideus fecit. We're getting close to the end. So here's another Cicero. Ely non solum pecunium sed etiam vitam. Pro patrio profundirant. Very typical Cicero here. So make notice we have an on solum sed etiam. So remember how you translate those when you see them. Nice Tacitus uh, sentence here. Reges Romam a principio habuere. Libertatem Lucius Brutus Romanis dedit. Interesting sentence when you translate this one. So keep in mind that we're actually talking about this Brutus character. Uh, so I'll give you a little hint about what it's talking about. Reges Romam a principio habuere. Libertatem Lucius Brutus Romanis dated. So Bruce, Brutus is going to do something for us here. Sub Kaisere autem libertatem per didimus. So they're going to tell you a little bit of something here about how they feel about Caesar. Sub Caesare autem libertatem per didimus. And then last but not least, quando, uh, li let's start over here, quando libertas que quiterit, nemo libere dicere audibit. So again, sometimes you know, you kind of stumble over this stuff, but do the best you can. Make sure you read these aloud as you're going through them. Um, it makes it a little bit easier to figure out exactly what they're saying here. You can kind of hear it and, and, and think about what they're trying to say. Uh, quando 
Libertas que quiteret, nemo libere dicere audebit. So we'll see if we can figure out what uh, Publius Cyrus is trying to say there. So again, more stuff to stick into your head, more endings to memorize. The good news is, you know, two out of the three endings we've seen before. So just a few endings to add to our memory. And now we can talk about things that happened in the past and don't have a real connection to the present. So we'll be able to look at these historical writings and have a better understanding of how the Romans saw themselves and how they saw history from their perspective. So this is the end of Latin, uh, Latin 2, Chapter 12. And hopefully pretty soon I'll have a video up for Chapter 13. So, well, Ante, and I will talk to you soon.